This lecture will look at the pathophysiology of mitral valve regurgitation, which is also referred to as mitral valve insufficiency. At this time, I'd like to talk about acute mitral valve regurgitation, and then after discussing the acute form of mitral valve regurgitation, I'll then talk about a chronic form of regurgitation. So with the acute form of mitral regurgitation, this can occur, for example, following rupture of the chordate tendony. And when that happens, the mitral valve leaflets will bulge back into the left atrium during left ventricular systole when left ventricular pressure um, is increased. And this will cause flow to go back into the left atrium as well as out and into the aorta. So the regurgitation occurs during ventricular systole. Because of this flow going back into the left atrium during ventricular systole, left atrial pressure will become greatly increased. In this case, it's, I'm showing it to be 30 millimeters of mercury, and that's well over the threshold that would cause pulmonary edema to occur. And because of the increased in left atrial pressure, because of this volume overload condition, as the left ventricle fills with blood, it's going to fill to this higher pressure. And so left ventricular and diastolic pressure may also be greatly elevated. Now there are some other changes that I've depicted here in this figure. One is that the systolic pressure of the left ventricle may be reduced. And the reason for that is that not as much blood is going into the aorta. The forward flow into the aorta may be reduced, and so aortic pressure may be reduced. And if aortic systolic pressure happens to be 100, then the left ventricular pressure would be about 100. And finally, let me point out what happens to the left ventricle and to the atrium. With this acute uh, mitral valve regurgitation and this acute increase in left ventricular volume, uh, you're going to have it you know, enlarged, but this is just a passive distension of the left ventricle. And the left atrium will be enlarged once again due to passive distension of the left atrium, but this is not a remodeling effect because this is acute regurgitation. When we have regurgitation uh, back through that mitral valve, we are dividing now the stroke volume between what goes into the aorta and what goes back up into the left atrium. So we can calculate a regurgitant fraction, much like we did for the aortic valve uh, regurgitation. So let's assume that with this increased volume in this ventricle that our stroke volume, or, or EDV minus ESV, is now 100 mLs of blood. But we may have a situation occur where the forward stroke volume into the aorta is only 50 mLs, and the backward flow, recurgitant flow, into the left atrium is also 50 mLs. In this case, the regurgitant fraction would be 50. In other words, the, the volume of blood that regurgitates versus the total stroke volume is 0.5 or 50%. Now, the value for this regurgitant fraction is going to depend on the ratio of aortic and mitral resistances and aortic and left atrial pressures. And I'll come back to this point a little bit more later on. But if this has a very, very low resistance um, and relative to the aortic valve when it opens, then you'll get more regurgitant flow through here. And if you alter the pressures in either the aorta or in the left atrium, that can affect also the regurgitant fraction. Well, let's see what happens to volumes and pressures in the ventricle and also the generation of the murmur. Because we have a volume overload condition on the ventricle, because it fills now with a much greater volume because you have a much greater volume within the left atrium because you've ejected up blood up into the left atrium plus you're still getting your normal pulmonary flow into the left atrium. 
So the ventricle fills to a very high volume and a very, therefore, very high end diastolic pressure, as, talk, as shown in the last slide. Now, the aortic pressures and the left ventricular pressure during systole may appear to be uh, very normal, except it might be reduced if there is significant reduction in the cardiac output. But there's no gradient across the aortic valve because it is normal. But look what happens to the left atrial pressure during ventricular systole. During this time, the left atrium is receiving blood from the pulmonary veins. That's what normally occurs, and that leads to the generation of the V wave. But because the left the left atrium is already so engorged with blood, then as blood is coming back into the left atrium from the pulmonary system, it's going to increase the left atrial pressure dramatically so that there will be a very tall V wave on the pressure pulse. And then, of course, that pressure falls and you have the wide descent once the mitral valve opens and to fill the ventricle. Now, in terms of the murmur, the murmur is going to begin at S1 because once the ventricle begins to contract, even before the aortic valve opens, it is going to begin ejecting blood back, backwards into the left atrium and there'll be turbulence that will occur. And it will occur throughout ventricular contraction and ejection. And so we have what is called a holosystolic murmur. And notice that the murmur actually goes beyond S2. This is where the aortic valve um, closes. But we're still going to have the aortic pressure greater than the left atrial pressure. So blood will still be coming into the left atrium from the ventricle until finally the pressures will equilibrate and the left ventricle left ventricular pressure starts to fall below the left atrial pressure and the ventricle then begins to fill with blood. So this is termed a holosystolic murmur and it literally goes beyond, a short distance beyond S2. Well let's look at now the changes in the pressure volume loop that occurs with acute mitral regurgitation. So I've drawn the normal loop and I've drawn the loop depicting this mitral regurge, acute mitral regurge. And notice that we haven't changed our compliance curve for filling. It's the same curve because this is a rapid response. It might occur you know, within, you know, within a heartbeat of, of the rupture of the chordae tendony, where it's gonna to fill to a higher volume, but to a very high end diastolic pressure which would be a very high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And then as soon as the ventricle begins to contract, there's no isovolumetric phase because as soon as it begins to contract and develop pressure, it will eject blood into the left atrium and it will continue to increase its pressure. It's still ejecting blood into the left atrium and then the aortic valve would open. It will eject blood also into the aorta. And now when the aortic valve closes, let's say it closes right here. Normally there's isovolumetric relaxation, but we don't see a vertical line. In fact, even after the aortic valve closes, the volume in the ventricle continues to decline a small amount because blood is flowing from the ventricle, which has a higher pressure than the left atrium. So regurgitation continues into what would normally be called the isovolumetric uh, relaxation phase. And then finally, at this point, the left atrial pressure at the peak of the V wave, left atrial pressure is greater than left ventricular pressure and the left ventricular, and the left ventricle will begin, and the left ventricle will begin to uh, fill with blood from the left atrium. Now, if we look at some numbers here, we see that with this acute um, mitral regurge, that the stroke volume will be increased. So it might be 100 mils. There'll be a greater end diastolic volume. The end systolic volume will be reduced. The ejection fraction, if you calculate it from the loop here, it's going to be it's going to be higher than what it was in the control condition. Now the forward flow, however, may be reduced, even though it has a very high stroke volume, 
because half of that stroke volume is going backwards into the left atrium, the other half is what's going into the aorta. So the actual ejection of blood into the aorta is reduced because so much of the blood flow is going back into the left atrium. And that's when the regurgitant fraction would be 0.5, which I was in my example a few slides ago. Then the other, of course, important point to note is the very high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Now let's look at the difference between acute and chronic mitral regurgitation. Of course, the, the chronic mitral regurgitation is more common than the acute. But the response of the heart is very different in acute versus chronic. So on the left is what I was depicting in the last several slides for acute mitral regurg with a regurgitant fraction of 0.5. But now on the right, I'm depicting what happens if we have a chronic condition where the leaflets are not closing your ventricular systole fully. And so over a period of time, this volume overload on the ventricle and on the left atrium is going to result in remodeling. And so the left atrium dilates, which increases the left atrial compliance. And when the left atrium dilates and you have reduced compliance, that will reduce the pressure within the left atrium. So the remodeling helps to reduce that very high pressure that may, have, that may be 30 in, an, in response to an acute regurge, but with over a period of time, it will become reduced because of the remodeling that occurs in the wall of the left atrium. We will also have dilation of the left ventricle, and so it becomes more compliant and these compliance changes now and pressure changes alter the regurgitant fraction. So when you have a lower left atrial pressure, you're now going to get a higher fraction of that ejected blood going into the left atrium. Because remember this pressure here and this pressure here, that difference between the two is what determines the rate of flow across that left that cross that mitral valve. So if this pressure becomes lower, you're going to have more flow. In other words, the regurgitant fraction will be increased. So now, instead of being 0.5, it might be 0.6, meaning that only 40% of the total stroke volume, if it's still 100, is actually going into the aorta. But the benefit of the dilation of the ventricle is that end of the atrium is that it will reduce the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Let's look at some numbers. These two columns are the same as what I showed you a couple slides ago. And this is the same slide here, except now I've added in chronic mitral regurgitation. Notice that I've altered the filling uh, curve for the left ventricle to depict that the ventricle has now remodeled. It's now chronically dilated. And that enables the end diastolic volume to be very high. And the result of this is that the end systolic volume, which is elevated, but the stroke volume is still elevated, not as much as it was in the acute phase. The stroke volume may be reduced and the ejection fraction is starting to fall some. It's still not too bad. It's still pretty good systolic function. But look what happened to the forward flow. With the chronic dilation, as I mentioned in the last slide, the forward flow into the aorta is reduced compared to the acute. And the backward flow is increased compared to the acute state so that the regurgitant fraction is elevated. So you might say, well, how is this beneficial to the heart? As the heart remodels, it's ejecting less blood into the aorta. Well, that's not necessarily great, but we have other compensatory mechanisms in the body. Hopefully that will maintain blood pressure adequate to perfuse the organs of the body. But the main thing that it does 
this alteration in pressures and therefore the regurgitant fraction is to lead to an increase, a decrease in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in the chronic state relative to what you would have with an acute regurgitation. So let's summarize uh, the differences here uh, by looking at chronic mitral valve regurgitation. With chronic mitral valve regurgitation, we get ventricular dilation, a large increase in, in EDV, and we have eccentric hypertrophy occur. We get an increase in stroke volume, a very large increase in stroke volume, but with a decrease in stroke volume into the aorta, so that's reduced forward flow. We get atrial distension and an increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, although that is less in this chronic condition than it would have been in an acute regurgitation. We have a very tall V wave because um, of the higher pressures within the left atrium. We have a holosystolic murmur that occurs. We have no phase of isovolumetric relaxation or contraction because we have no phase during the cardiac cycle where all four heart valves are closed. And finally, because of that large increase in the width of the pressure volume loop, and the increase in wall stress on that pressure volume uh, with the pressure volume loop, there'll be a large increase in myocardial oxygen demand.